Condoleezza Rice is back. One of the worst and most hawkish neocons of the early 2000s just wrote a long article in Foreign Affairs, the ideological mothership of these creatures from hell. This is noteworthy for two reasons. A, the timing and the subtext in light of the upcoming presidential elections, and B, for the unapologetic neocon worldview that these people still tout out even after decades of their failed but blood-stained foreign policies. So, to understand this better, let's have a look at the text and what we can learn from it. I'm talking about this article here, The Perils of Isolationism. The world still needs America, and America still needs the world, by Condoleezza Rice. And just in case you forgot who uh, Con this Condoleezza Rice person is, she was the, uh, the 66th Secretary of State of the United States from 2005 until 2009, under the second uh, George uh, W. Bush administration for the second term uh, of George W. Bush, and under the first George W. Bush administration when, the, you know, when they went in into Afghanistan and into Iraq when they did all of these crimes, she was the national security advisor for, for that team. So she held the position that currently Jake Sullivan has as one of the, of the main ideologues of the White House at the time. She's the person who, who was so proud back in the early 2000s when she came out and said that now finally the United States has a grand strategy and the grand strategy is basically to dominate everything and everyone and a, a lot of the horrors that we are seeing in the Middle East and that we have been seeing over the past 20-25 years are um, at a good amount of her doing. She's one of the main people who who uh, made sure that then the, the Middle East became this uh, this absolute uh, catastrophe and and uh, one country after an another from uh, from Afghanistan over Iraq and uh, and Libya and, uh, and Syria and so on kept falling one after another and she was at the beginning of that uh, of of that movement now Condoleezza Rice in foreign affairs is noteworthy because she doesn't write there very often. Uh, she only had three articles in this in this magazine. The first one she wrote at the very beginning of her stellar ascent to the highest levels of uh, White House policy making uh, in the year 2000 uh, that was when she wrote about her campaign 2000 promoting the national interest and then she wrote again toward the very end of her of her tenure when she was about to go out as the um, secretary uh, secretary of state or in her last year uh, when she wrote about rethinking the national interest and now she's back again with the perils of isolationism and you can probably imagine what this uh, article will argue for uh, but in let's let's have a look at it you know when you read articles like these there are it's a long article uh, it's many pages uh, uh, on my on my little PDF here, it's twenty eight pages. And if you if you go through them, it always makes sense to start at the end because that's where they try to really drive the point home, right? Everything else channels you towards these last couple of sentences when they try to, uh, with the full weight of the entire essay, try to convince you of something. She argues that if the nineteenth century and early twentieth centuries taught Americans anything, it is this. Other great powers don't mind their own business. Instead, they seek to shape the global order. The future will be determined by the alliance of democratic free market states, or it will be determined by the revisionist powers harking back to a day of territorial conquest abroad and authoritarian practices at home. There is simply no other option. Exactly what you would expect from a neocon. She she creates the Manichaean world in where where you have good and evil on two sides, and the decision of the United States of America is whether it wants to stand up to evil and fight for light, or whether it will withdraw and let the world sink into utter chaos and burn because of negligence. <laughs> That's how dumb it is, but it is it is that argument on on twenty eight or twenty four twenty five pages. Um, it, it I, I yeah, it, it's laughable if it wasn't so dramatic because these people actually do hold power. Um, and again, like let me just show you also these uh, two minutes 
of a speech that she gave 13 years ago, so around the year 2010, when she still defended the Iraq war. And she is doing that to this day. To this day, she says, like, no, 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 Iraq, it was a very important war. It was, 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 was really clear that we had to go in. And in 2010, she argued like this. On Iraq, books have been written, as you know, many, many books, documentaries have been made about how intelligence was incorrectly analyzed and cherry-picked to build an argument for war. And memos from that time do suggest that officials knew there was a small chance of actually finding weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Well, wait a second. What? <laughs> there's, there's some things that seem to suggest that up in the build-up to, to the actual war mm -hmm. that there was some doubt uh, about that, wouldn't you say? That no. <laughs> well, actually, I don't agree with that. You don't, at all. even no. with when Tony Blair met with the president in Washington. Look, you always are you one hundred percent sure when you're dealing with an opaque, secretive country in which there have been no inspections for years? No, you're not one hundred percent sure. But the preponderance of intelligence analysis, the preponderance of intelligence analysis from around the world was that he had had weapons of mass destruction. We knew he had used weapons of mass destruction. That was not a theoretical proposition. Right, no, that's he correct. He used them. Against the Kurds. Against the Kurds, against the Shia, uh, and against the Iranians. So he'd used them uh, several times. And uh, the preponderance of intelligence was that he was reconstituting, or had actually, in the intelligence estimate, reconstituted his biological and chemical capabilities. There was some debate about how far he had gotten on the nuclear front, some saying that with foreign help it could be a year, others saying it would be several years. So uh, no, it's simply not the case that there was, um, if you're in, in a position of decision making, uh, evidence to say that uh, it was likely that he did not have weapons of mass destruction. Now, um, what we found... See this thinking that when you're in a position of decision-making, that's where she was in, and she saw it as part of her, of her duty to make sure that hundreds of thousands of Iraqis died because she wasn't sure that he didn't have <laughs> uh, weapons of mass destruction. That was the mindset of the early 2000s, of the unipolar moment. She reigned in... Washington, or she was among the top class of people who reigned in a foreign policy world during the, that unipolar moment when the United States could do something like this. Just by arguing that they were not sure, because as Rumsfeld told us, the, uh, the absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. That was the catchphrase, and it is a stupid tautological, a dumb catchphrase, but it that was used and it was enough to actually have their way and invade not only Afghanistan, but then also Iraq, um, Afghanistan with you, uh, Security Council consent, Afghan, uh, Iraq without it. And this is, this was this, this, this mentality of utter impunity that even if your decisions are based on factually wrong information that nothing will happen to you and nothing did happen to her she did become the president of the hoover institution or the sorry she, she might also just be the president the, the president of the board but you know she this very very lucrative life that she was that she was living after being responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands if not millions of people including uh, going right into private business after uh, finishing her her four years as Secretary of State. He became uh, a founding partner of Rice, Headley and Gates, an international strategic consulting firm based in Silicon Valley and Washington, D.C. The firm works with senior executives of major companies to implement strategic plans and expand in emerging markets. This woman then went straight into selling access, the access that she got by being for eight years in these highest positions and getting the phone numbers and email addresses of all of these important um, statesmen from around the world and then selling that access to private companies and making millions, without doubt millions, uh, tens of millions. Um, to the point where in 2022 she even became a part owner of the Denver Broncos. Did you know any Denver Broncos fans there? I mean, Condoleezza Rice owns part of that thing now. <laughs> um, 
yeah, and uh, this is, and now she's even parked at the Hoover Institution, you know, as if though these people don't already have enough money, but then they also need the positions, right, for the self-esteem and, and in order to show off how important they still are, even after uh, retiring. And so she now writes this article here on the Paris of Isolationism, and um, obviously she's doing that in order to position herself against the rhetoric of Donald, uh, Donald Trump. Which is highly interesting because Donald Trump is now the uh, front runner again for the for the Republicans, right? For the um, for the pre uh, he is the nominee for the presidential election, and Condoleezza Rice was of course serving under a. Republican president George W. Bush Jr. But by now we've seen this realignment happening in both parties, in which basically the pro-war faction of the uh, uh, of the neocons in the Republican Party has moved away and has started endorsing, of course, Kamala Harris and the the Democratic Party, the few uh, figureheads that were anti-war and anti-interventionism uh, abroad and anti-forever wars. To Gabbard and um, most importantly now um, uh, Mr. Kennedy, they moved towards Mr. Trump. So an, a complete inverse uh, inversion basically of the foreign policy stances, the classical foreign policy stances of these parties, because Donald Trump managed to rally the Republican Party or the Republican base, let's say, around the idea of us ending the forever wars. And what the Democrats are doing, and people like her, the conservatives who still want to uh, want to warmonger and bomb every single country on earth that doesn't uh, precisely execute US demands, they're branding this strain um, as isolationists, that if you are not willing to have another war in Iraq, in the Middle East, in, and, and if you're not willing to go and bomb hundreds of thousands of people, then you are an isolationist. That's the trick that's happening. This is, of course, also something that stands in stark contrast to the United States uh, history of actually using neutrality policy ever since uh, George Washington in 1793 in order to not be sucked into wars all over the world, uh, which then was abandoned in 1941 and never came back. And Condoleezza Rice is proud of this history of 80 years of warmongering. Um, everywhere, anywhere, and in trying to dominate the world. And this is this is very clear from, from how she writes. So let's just go through a couple of her um, of her depictions here. For instance, she starts by setting the stage of making sure that people do not think of what's currently going on as a second Cold War. That's one of the points where I agree with her. She writes that today's favorite analogy is the Cold War. The United States again faces an adversary that has global reach and insatiable ambitions with China taking the place of the Soviet Union. But China is not the Soviet Union. Uh, and she continues drawing a picture in which she says that we are closer again to the to a 19th century uh, 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 moment. So she does to an extent recognize multipolarity, although she herself lapses then back into a pure Cold War and post-Cold War mentality. Um, she says that the imperialism of the late 19th century, now as then, revisionist powers are acquiring territory through force and the international order is breaking down. So painting this picture that we are that we are back again in an, in a, in a moment where we could go to the interwar period and that uh, US leadership is needed and by leadership she means of course military leadership it's that's the only thing that these people uh, can think about because they think in terms of domination of course they fluffy they fluff it up and try to package this message as uh, as a, a form of uh, trying to bring peace to the world. <laughs> but the peace is only what they accept as peace and, and uh, what they accept as a, a, a okay political reality. Anything else, anyone who doesn't want to go along needs to be bombed, needs to be killed, needs to be eradicated. These are really the worst kind of people that the, uh, the hegemony of the United States and his military power swept to the surface. Then she talks about Xi Jinping and how and what kind of threat China is. Beijing's aggressive military activities around Taiwan. She she 
talks about those and then about the strategic ambiguity, how this is a problem and how the United States need to, needs to help this little democracy and so on. And that the growth in China's nuclear arsenal is also alarming. She does this very typical thing that you can see like for the last 15 years and this threat inflation of how China is dangerous and how they ever grow their 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 arsenal and their and their uh, war making capacities this sentence of uh, increasingly belligerent or increasingly assertive China that keeps popping up again and again for at least 10 years now uh, in all kinds of uh, western media in order to to uh, create this sense of threat to uh, to the United States, to the world, right? Because the, if repetition is key in order to uh, bring across a message. And the, the propaganda in the West, which is not centrally organized propaganda, it's decentralized or, or propaganda, but it has institutionalized certain images. And this is one of them, this threat inflation that China is, of course, super dangerous, right? And, and the only way to counter a super dangerous, evil empire on the other side of the Pacific is by gearing up yourself and, and take on the burden, take on the duty, the backpack of uh, being a good and civilized nation in order to stand up to autocrats. That's the, the, the eternal spiel of these people, which uh, it's hard to me that, to believe that people fall for this, but they do, <laughs> which is why we need to point this out uh, time and again. She writes that it is hard to overstate the shock and sense of betrayal that gripped United States leaders. U.S. policy toward China was always something of an experiment with proponents of economic engagement betting that it would induce political reform. We must remember that she still uh, was... She was national security advisor at the beginning when also the, United, the China joined the WTO. And back then the whole the whole idea of these people was, or at least that's what they're saying now. They're saying that they wanted to, to induce political reform by integrating China into the world economy. And they expected, and not only expected, but demanded, demanded a change in China's uh, leadership structure in return for uh, integrating it into the uh, Western global um, uh, market economy. And this is, it's really interesting that she writes that it is hard to overstate the shock and sense of betrayal that gripped her and others, that China didn't, that China dared to have a different political system even after it was integrated because integrating China was done by the grace and, and of, of, of the selfless United States and the selfless West. But China refused to change that evil entity in the East. It seemed inevitable that China would change internally since economic liberalization and political control were ultimately incompatible. That was the belief, of, apparently. She came to power agreeing with this maxim, but not in the way the West had hoped. Instead, economic liberalization, he chose political control. And that's the betrayal. That's the betrayal that China dared to have a different political system. Not surprisingly, the United States eventually reversed course. A bipartisan agreement emerged that China's behavior was unacceptable. As a result, the United States technological decoupling from China is now well underway. So the, can you see how this framing is happening that um, that decoupling from China is ultimately China's mis uh, uh, mistake, of course, and is, is to blame solely on China because China refused to to adhere to U.S. expectations and U.S. demands for a different regime type. This is this is as neocon as it gets. And these people don't even I, I think they don't even comprehend how how utterly uh, 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 how 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 this comes down from this high horse and how this this demand is just ridiculous that it should be the United States that the, that that tells other other countries how they run their show. But this is how they think and not doing so is an insult to them as they write in their essays. Well, then she goes on and she writes a bit about the uh, the Russian Empire reborn, and this is a story that we all that we all super familiar with, right? You never mention the Maidan, you never mention all of the meddling, U.S. meddling and and, and Western meddling inside Ukraine. You start 
history um, with the 2014 annexation of Crimea and then uh, with the full-scale invasion in 2022 and you create the narrative of Russia just being a um, revisionist power that wants to re uh, rebuild the Russian Empire or uh, maybe even the Soviet Union but then she still has this need of constantly belittling Russia and telling them how how bad things are going um, Putin's gambit has produced a strategic alignment among Europe and, and Europe and among Europe and the United States and much of the rest of the world, leading to extensive sanctions against Russia. It is now an isolated and heavily militarized state. So this is this is just a fantasy world in which they're living in, right? I mean, the only ones who, who put sanctions on Russia are North America, uh, US and Canada, um, NATO states and a couple of other European states, Japan, Korea, and I think Singapore. That's about it. That's about the extent. And then a couple of others do do some sanctions because of second um, the, the the chances of secondary sanctions, like the Euro, um, United Arab Emirates on 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 Russia's banking sector. But that's it. The, Russia is anything but isolated. Uh, Vladimir Putin does travel to to East and Southeast Asia. He does travel to China. He travels to Africa. He's able to go to many different places and 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 these and leaders from these global south countries go and visit russia uh, russia is currently building together with the BRICS an alternative way an alternative system to uh, interact in the world through the this glo the global infrastructure but that's something that these people either they don't see it or they actively try to ignore it because they want to paint a picture right they they do not report reality they try to fabricate a reality um, which then serves their argument um, and again the belittling of russia the embarrassing first year of the war exposed the weakness of the russian armed forces so she does what we what we know that these people do they they constantly talk up the threat of Russia and China, but then they also belittle them and tell, tell us that their economies are doing uh, doing poorly, that their regimes are unstable and that it's, you know, that they are structurally um, meant to fail in the future uh, and that all the West needs to do is to push a little bit more in, in that direction. That's actually where she lapses back into the Cold War mentality. She says that Russia's talented central banker, uh, Elvira Nab Nabulina, um, has covered up many of the economy of the economy's vulnerabilities, walking a tightrope without access to the 300 billion frozen assets held in the West. And China has stepped in to take off some of the pressure. So the way she explains that Russia is not yet uh, bankrupt and and begging for a World Bank uh, bailout is that they she had Russia luckily has one capable uh, female central banker and China is the big brother who who helps out uh, with anything so that's that's the explanatory model that they have that these sanctions that they've been putting on Russia are failing and in their little world this serves of course two purposes one again um, saying that Russia is is ruled by imbeciles, except for a couple of uh, of uh, exceptions that they can that they can actually admit. And um, China, you can put the blame for Russia not failing on China, whereby you connect these two theaters that you want to have anyhow. It's 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 a beautiful little narrative uh, for as dumb as it is. Uh, and then uh, again, back to the China, to China threat, because Condoleezza Rice obviously subscribes to the idea that the real threat is China, it's not Russia. She starts with China and she comes back to China all the time. Beijing cannot let Putin loose, but likely has no real enthusiasm for his adventurism on behalf of a new Russian empire, particularly if it if it puts China in the crosshairs of secondary sanction is in, in its own struggling economy. So she's starting to build up the argument that if you just also put enough sanctions on China and, and push China enough, then they will break with Russia. And then we, you can finally let Russia die a natural death. That's how they see the world. But it gets really, really interesting when we get a little bit farther down to how she sees the crumbling order um the current order coming down because that's their big fear right the united states is not scared of not g getting more power it's it's scared of losing power it's scared of not being the top dog anymore and this is the section in which this comes out most clearly read this look at this this sentence the post world war ii liberal order was a direct response to the horrors 
of the interwar period. Let, let this sink in for a moment. The post-World War II liberal order was a direct response to the horrors of the interwar period. Usually when somebody says that, you know, the way that the post-Second World War uh, uh, international world was structured was a re response to the horrors of the Second World War, right? You quote the horrors of the Second World War because you had tens of millions of people who died in the Second World War. She doesn't talk about those horrors, the death of tens of millions of people is not the horror. The horror is the interwar period, <laughs> which, because it was between wars, was actually peaceful, right? But that's the horror. And why is that the horror? Because the absence of the United States as a kind of offshore mediator contributed to the breakdown of the previous, uh, of the previous order. Because in this interwar period, so we are talking 1919 to uh, 1939, and during these 20 years, Asian and European powers left to their own devices fell into catastrophic conflict. The horror is that the United States in the interwar period did not become the, the um, hegemon that it is today, that actually after the First World War, when the United States briefly for one and a half years fought in Europe, that it went back to the United States and actually uh, minded its own business. And because it didn't interfere anymore in the globe, that's then how we got the Second World War, because Asian and European powers are too dumb, too stupid, too... Uh, incapable of um, of managing their own affairs. That's why you need the benevolent force of the United States, which then brings peace. And after the Second World War, the United States learned that lesson and we had eternal peace for the last 80 years. Oh, wait a second. Um, well, let's, I mean, let's ignore all of the wars the United States imposed on other countries. But apart from all of those wars, it was blissful peace. <laughs> everywhere in the world. That's the mindset of these sick bastards. After World War II, the United States and its allies built an economic order that was no longer a zero-sum game. So here we go into um, lauding and applauding the wisdom of the United States of building a good order, a good Cold War order, which was so incredibly peaceful. She continues, globalization will continue in some form, but the sense that it is a positive force has lost steam. So she start, starts talking about globalization here and how that uh, uh, what the world looked like when she uh, was was working on it, and then she, in in the two thousands, and then she keeps lapsing back into the Cold War because she has another um, another section talking about how, uh, the lessons of the Cold War and how George Kennan's long telegram of nineteen forty six, um, the idea of containment of an adversary should be revived again um, should should be revived again now today she says russia's internal contradictions are obvious putin has undone 30 plus years of russian integration into the international economy and relies on a network of opportunistic states that throw crumbs his way to sustain the regime no one knows how long the shell of Russian greatness can survive, but it can do a lot of harm before it cracks. Resisting and deterring Russian military aggression is essential until it does. This is like, again, she's just expecting Russia to end the way the Soviet Union ended by like breaking apart itself because of internal contradictions. So you see that these people, even when they say that we that they recognize it's not a Cold War anymore, that they still live in a Cold War mentality and that they live in a, in a mentality of Reagan domination. If we just outspend everybody else, everybody else is going to crack um, because the United States is the only country that lives without internal uh, contradictions and that has unlimited power and unlimited resources um, while all of all of the other states especially the big ones um, also with all the, with nuclear weapons they will implode by themselves these people have learned the absolute wrong lesson of history and they try to lecture everybody else on history putin counts on a cowed and poorly informed population and his regime indoctrinates young people in ways that are reminiscent of hitler youth it's these kind of these kind of statements are just as bad as they get. It's, it's, she's, she's also one of those who compares Putin to Hitler and, and, and thinks that he's the only reason why uh, Russia is doing what it does. Uh, and I again, I don't know whether she believes this nonsense, which people who 
who worked in the State Department and who are much smarter than her could have told her, like Chuck Matlock, like, like the George Kennan, whom she quoted at the very beginning, these people opposed NATO expansion. These people were against, uh, against triumphalism. These people were... Uh, they didn't want the, the, the 2000s, the 1990s to play out the way they did, and they were utterly right. But she even uses these people then to say, like, look, um, what they said at the beginning of the Cold War should apply now. And then they ignore all of the all of the other th important things that that people who actually wanted stability uh, said later on. It's really, really sad. And again, like the the hubris and the the nerve of these people is incredible. Just look at this. Russia, Russia's human potential has always been great. Despite what often seems like a deliberate plot by its leaders to destroy it, it is incumbent on the United States, Europe and others to keep some connections to the Russian people. Russians should be allowed, when possible, to study and work abroad. They should be allowed. The United States and, and Europe, the satellites, should be, should be, should have the grace, should have the heart and the, the kindness to embrace some Russians who should be allowed to somewhat get an education and study. They really think that they are the only ones able to uh, to provide a good education. And they, they do think that this is an adequate way of talking about um, uh, the, the population of, of, of another great power. This, that's why that's why these people have no reverse gear, as uh, as uh, Alex Christoforo uh, keeps saying in his in his videos on the Duran, that they they believe in this in this megalomaniac worldview that it is upon them to bestow things on others, uh, and 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 that there is no other independent agency except for them. China's future is by no means as bleak as Russia's. Isn't it ni that nice to know? Um, another contradiction stems from the uneasy coexistence of capitalism and of authoritarian uh, communism in China. Because her analysis is that she has turned out to be a true Marxist. China's golden age of private sector-led growth has slowed in large part because of the Chinese Communist Party's anxiety about alternative sources of power. China used to lead the world in online education and startups, but in 2021, the government cracked down on them because it could not reliably monitor their content. A once thriving entrepreneurial culture was withered away. She here talks about this incident in which China really uh, cracked down on its online education space because it uh, the, the because the, the the CCP didn't didn't appreciate anymore all of these uh, all of the pressure being put on on school children with uh, after school online learning and um, it also cracked down on the, the the gaming space and so on and the china just sh showed several times that it is willing to crack down on on certain branches of the economy that it thinks is negative for the development of the nation and this is unthinkable for free marketeers it, and 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 crony capitalists like Condoleezza Rice who think that it is the economy that should steer the the boat of the state and that the, that the state has to do everything and anything in service of helping uh, capitalists to make even more money than they already have. China has a different model and, the chi and Chinese scholars have been pointing out that while China is a market economy, it is not a capitalist country because the capitalists do not have power over the political process. It's the other way around. The, polit the political leaders have power over the capitalists and whenever one of the capitalists like Jack Ma get a little bit too powerful, they will be cracked down upon uh, relentlessly, and if they if they don't give in, then that's it for them. Now, I'm not saying that I'm happy with this. That's uh, th that model obviously also has its problems, but it is again very fascinating that Condoleezza Rice is one of these people who cannot accept that, right, and who uses that as an analysis of why China will fail eventually, because obviously only a system that is designed after the one that the United States has can be a successful system. Anything else is doomed to fail. That's how these people work. Um, and then again, like uh, the she comes to toward the end, what the United States must 
do, the United States needs to maintain the defense capabilities sufficient to deny China, Russia or Iran their strategic goals. The war in Ukraine has revealed weakness in the US defense industrial base that must be uh, remedied. So please send more weapons, give us more money for weapons. Critical reforms need to be made to the defense budgeting process, uh, which is inadequate to this task. We need more money, we need more weapons, we need more war, is what she's saying. But also that beyond military capabilities, the United States must reveal the other element of diplomatic toolkit, such as information operations that have eroded since that have eroded since the Cold War. Uh, she's saying like uh, outright, like we need to do more propaganda abroad, right? Um, we need to do more psyops and we need to control foreign populations with the information that we're giving them. We are currently not doing enough of that, although the US is doing heaps of it. And if you just open the New York Times or any uh, or any newspaper in Europe, actually you see how the information, these information operations are working beautifully. So she's a She's a she's the worst imperialist, one of the worst imperialists in the US, and she's writing about it like very proudly, as if though she's giving us great world analysis, uh, while she accuses all of the other powers of being imperialists, right? But it gets very good again um, here when we also see how she either again lives in a fantasy world or she um, really has that kind of bad, uh, um, bad assessment of world affairs. Read this. The good news is that given the behavior of China and Russia, the United States allies are ready to contribute to the common defense. Many countries in the Asia-Pacific region, including Australia, the Philippines and Japan, recognize the threat and appear committed to addressing it. Um, so she's happy that other allies are now um, obviously want, uh, seem to want to do more, including um, Finland and Sweden that signed up for um, suicide and, and self-destruction within NATO. Um, and she, had, she still recommends that Ukraine should join NATO uh, and the European Union, as if though joining the European Union had ever been a problem. Um, Russia was never against uh, Ukrainian accession of the European Union. It was always about NATO and she still, um, they still double down. Again, no, uh, no reverse gear. But the interesting thing is that when she starts uh, enumerating all of the allies, she includes Vietnam. And, you know, you remember current day Vietnam is North Vietnam of back in the Vietnam War. It's the former US um, foe number one. Vietnam too appears willing to contribute given its own strategic um, concerns with China. The challenge will be to turn the ambitions of US partners into sustained commitment once the cost of enhanced defense capabilities become clear. Uh, and I highlight this sentence with Vietnam because you know Vietnam is doing its bamboo diplomacy. It's doing both. It's playing with China. It's 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 playing with China, it's playing with the United States in the sense of interacting with them, of buying weapons from, from, from everywhere. It's, it, it works with Russia. It works with everybody. It's not signed up to the US, um, US design of fighting more wars through proxies. But she, uh, just by seeing that Vietnam is, um, is diplomatically interacting with the United States, automatically interprets this as Vietnam now being in the US boat. Because these people cannot imagine that other countries might play with several powers, might, might be friends with everybody and might try to avoid polarization. In their, in their worldview, if somebody plays with us, they're on our side and, uh, or with the other side because they think in black and white. And then again, that she also says here that uh, the US must think about how to uh, bind the satellite states, uh, Japan, Germany, and so on, more closely to themselves in order to deploy their, uh, their military might uh, directly against adversaries, right? That's what she means when she talks about enhanced defense capabilities that need to be used and committed. Um, to to US objectives. It's really, really scary that these people tell us straight into our faces that what they want to do is is have closer control over uh, over their so-called allies, which by now are really just vassal states that the US tries to de deploy um, in, in its military schemes. And they tell us that. They tell us so in other words, but they this this is the design and she says the main question hanging over the international system today is where does america stand again everything hawks back to the united states everything revolves around the united states the u.s is the sun and the moon and the stars and the question is do the sun and the moon and the stars know what they want or are they are they are they afraid are they scared and she comes to her grand conclusion which i already read out to you 
um it is really scary and you know these people she has she's not in power now but this she's a main ideologue she's a pope of the neocons um she's she's beloved by many of them she's she's admired she teaches she she is a great elder states woman um and these people have have power in in their kind of vision of the of the world has power and it's just scary to see how these how they either have learned nothing of all of their horrible crimes that they committed or even worse they are fully aware of what they did and they want to do more because domination is the only thing they want while accusing everybody else of being guilty of their own sins pure projection um, and this is these are just the people we have to deal with and, and we have to keep an eye on. I don't know if we can ever wrestle power away from them. Uh, we'll see. Thank you for your attention.